Hi, I'm Amy McDonald, Director of City Space. Welcome to National Poetry Month, April 29th. This is WBUR's Celebration of Poetry. It's part of a series that we're doing called Ones to Watch. And we've got eight performances. It began in February, it goes through June, of up and coming artists in Boston. The next one is going to be in Maine, and in May, May 14th, Saturday. Check out our website. It's Jenny Oliver and her dance performance. And you just go to wbur.org slash events. It's going to be fascinating. So sign up for a newsletter, see what's coming up. Portia has been a dream collaborator, our Boston, City of Boston Poet Laureate, and she pulled together the poets who you're going to hear tonight, who are each going to recite a poem. And thank you, DJ Y. Sham, who was also here for our artists, <laughs> for the, uh, uh, the WBUR celebration of Artery 25. So welcome back. And she will be introducing each poet with a little music. And here we go, Portia. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Good. It's so good to see you all. I feel like I haven't been in an in-person event. I, I've been in in-person events all week, but, you know, it's still very new. I think this is like one of my uh, first poetry readings that I'm participating in. Um, and because that is so, um, I also want to just uh, quickly start with a land acknowledgement, um, if that's really cool. Um, so Boston resides on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Massachusetts people and neighboring Wampanoag Nation. We pay respect to the Massachusetts elders, past and present. We acknowledge the truth of violence perpetuated in the name of this country and make a commitment to uncovering that truth. We make this acknowledgement as a step toward dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and as a commitment to social justice. We also acknowledge and trace this country's modern existence to the historical enslavement of black and African people. We recognize that the genocide of indigenous people occurred conjuncturally and alongside um, the enslavement of Africans in the name of this country. Um, so let's take a really quick moment of silence. And I also just want to give a quick moment of shout because um, so many of us are uh, alive and living and joyful and screaming um, and carrying on the, the legacy of ancestors, right? So you could just yell out, you could yell out somebody's name, you could just breathe, you could be like, woo! Okay, that was okay, that was okay. Um, th that's like one thing I do not like about concerts is that it's like forced participation, you know? Like, stand up, yell, scream, you know, it's just like, ah. Um, but let's try that one more time, woo! Wow, that was incredible, that was incredible. Okay, word! Um, we're gonna get into this, I'm super excited. Happy National Poetry Month, everybody. Um, give it up one time for your DJ Washam. Um, we'll hear for, from the poets in this order. I'll give each of them their like um, due intro. Um, but just as a reminder for folks, uh, Angeliqua Linnea Verona Burkett, <laughs> Lloyd Schwartz, <laughs> Emmanuel Ompong Yebois, Otto Vock, Jara Lysega, and Amani Davis. Um, before we begin, is it okay if I start with a poem? Yes. Did anybody dress like their favorite writer? Okay, okay. That means you won the prize. No. Well, who'd you dress like if you don't mind us asking? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, friend, my friend is an author, y'all. She dressed as herself. Hey! That is a good friend. That was good teamwork, good pub work. I was going to say that as well. Can you guys uh, guess who I'm dressed like? 
Say it again. Somebody else said that. Actually, I don't know who that is, but somebody else said that earlier. No, I'm Audrey Lord. I'm totally kidding. I'm just myself, but you know. Sometimes we favor each other. But there's a photo of her and Pat Parker when she does have on like a little blazer, so you know, lineage. Um, okay, so I guess in my, this poem that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a poem real quick and then I'm gonna get out the way. Um, I guess I'm calling on the lineage of Toni Morrison, um, who, say it again? <laughs> no. Well, yes, actually. Also, Nikki Giovanni. No, I'm just, I'm kidding. Um, okay. That is clearly like the poet section. You gotta watch out for them, no. Um, but in the lineage of Toni Morrison, um, who wrote Beloved, um, which was based on, partly based on the life of Margaret Garner. Um, this poem is about Margaret Garner, um, who was um, an enslaved black woman who ran away from slavery. Um, she ran away with her children and she was crossing the Ohio River. Um, and as she was getting away, they, they caught up with her, the slave catchers caught up with her and she began to kill her children, right? Because she didn't want them to go, have to go back into slavery, right? Um, there was some like research I found that suggested that she was also being raped by the slave, slave master and right, three out of four of her children might have been um, from the master. But um, as she's like running away and they get caught and she kills her children, they then afterwards um, put her on trial, right? Um, and it is then determined that she must go down south, right? So she's then on the Mississippi River um, as it's a crueler punishment, if you will, uh, to be kind of so further down south. So this poem is about all of that. Um, I've been writing about water, so that, that's what got me here. Um, and um, it's a contrapuntal, so I'm gonna read it three ways. Um, the first, I told you the poets, you really. Um, the first part is called Margaret Garner Crosses the Ohio River. It's in the voice of the Ohio River. Folk stay gunning toward me like I'm the second coming, like every Medea ain't a god with purpose. Cross me like a crucifix and I will lay Ohio bare. There is no word for a mother who has lost just an unjust law rotting sweetly, blighting a fetus into the property of somebody willing to break a woman into a hollow harvest. Ascend up yonder, child. Wade through me like a hymn, a prayer, a river of Jordan, a gateway Fleeing the Dixie, I, the chariot freezing up, hardening myself in your quest. The next is called Margaret Garner Crosses the Ohio River, only to get caught and sold down the Mississippi in the voice of the Mississippi River. Like I'm some type of pistol, folks stay running from me. Mercy me, I thin the bloodline. I devane the country with a kitchen shank, Mississippi, sell them down river. There is no sympathy for a child gone to queen sugar. Cotton stalk crowning the bones, cane fields cankering the mouth, split the family into quarters with a slip of sail, big muddy, old man river, steamboat. I may be a womb of water, but can as easily be a rope, a tree poplar or dogwood, the soil of the South, the blood on mine hands, a bomb. Three, Margaret Garner crosses the Ohio River only to get caught and sold down the Mississippi or the mother stands trial for murdering her children in the voice of Margaret Garner. Folks stay gunning toward me like I'm some type of pistol like I'm the second coming, folks stay running from me like every Medea ain't a god with purpose. Every Medea ain't a god, mercy me. I thin the bloodline with purpose. 
Cross me like a crucifix and I devane the country with a kitchen shank. I will lay Ohio bare. There is no Mississippi, sell them down river. There is no word for a mother who has lost sympathy for a child gone to queen sugar, just an unjust law rotting sweetly. Cotton stalk crowning the bones, blighting a fetus into the property cane fields, cankering the mouth of somebody willing to break, split the family into quarters, a woman into a hollow harvest with a slip of sail, big muddy, a sin up yonder, child, wade, old man river steamboat through me like a hymn. I may be a womb of water, a prayer, a river of Jordan, but can as easily be a rope. A gateway fleeing the Dixie, I, a tree, poplar or dogwood, the chariot freezing up the soil of the South, hardening myself in your quest, the blood on my hands, a bomb. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Lloyd Schwartz, you are on deck. Um, but as we get into this evening, I first want to introduce you to the poet who goes by the name of Angeliqua Linnea Verana Burkett. Angeliqua was born and raised in Roxbury. I know, you gotta wait. I knew it was gonna, I know somebody was gonna, you know, you gotta wait when you hear Roxbury. Okay. Angeliqua was born and raised in Roxbury before moving to Rosendale. She is currently 18 years old and attends the John D. O'Brien School of Math and Science, where, through the 826 Writers' Room, she has been given space and community to truly hone and admire her love and technique for writing and poetry. Her cleverness and artistry stems from her own life experiences and wanting to connect with those around her. She has volunteered with organizations such as A Voice and Bark to spread awareness for social issues that impact her community and help make be, help be the blueprint for change. In everything Angeliqua does, she makes, it's, she makes sure it's her mission to express the feelings of people around her and her own and excuse me and everything she does she makes it her own mission to express the feelings of people around her as well as her own feelings um, she works to create a bright and better future Angeliqua was named Boston's second ever youth poet laureate in February 2022 Please show some love for the poet Angeliqua. <laughs> Hello. I actually really like that song a lot. <laughs> um Hi, everyone. My name is Angeliqua, as Portia just said. Um, and even though I perform like a lot, I always get really anxious. So I like to start like a little question. <laughs> That's okay. Has anyone for the past like two weeks been like battling their allergies as much as I have? Okay, okay. I have, I've been like taking Allegra like it is water for the past two weeks. And I don't know if I'm like going crazy, but I guess other people have been going through it too. So yeah. And it's even worse. I I work in a floral shop on weekends, and so, so I'm literally like dying at work, and the other day a customer came to me and asked a question. I sneezed, they said, nope, and went the other way. And I'm, like, I'm like, no, please, it's just my allergies, I promise. So I took an Allegra and I was like, oh, I feel better. But they're gone, so you know, whatever, next time I'll get them, maybe. <laughs> okay, so I feel more calm. Everyone seems cool, you know? <laughs> I can barely see y'all because the light is like blinding me, but you know, it's fine. I can look at my phone. Uh, <laughs> so I am not dressed like her, but the um, poet slash author who has influenced me or influenced two of these poems is Jacqueline Woodson. Um, yay! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> um, you may know her work, Miracle Boys or Brown Girl Dreaming or Afro Tupac and Dee Foster. 
all really good books I recommend you read. <laughs> um, the first few poems I'm going to read are based, well, the first one I'm going to read is based off her poem, Genetics, which is about, um, it's from Brown Girl Dreaming, and which is about um, like family traits being passed down, how that is how like, that's just the connection between the family, I guess. So this one is titled, The Time Is Now. After the dust and debris falling on top of a broken street. After the last hen died, leaving an old cow and a farm in debt. After the food dried up, turning an 11-year-old boy into a working man's hands, don't let the dust and debris fall flat. After the plane ride and $50 turned to two days worth of Burger King and diapers. After the six shelters in the dead of winter with Florida shorts. After tears by the Charles River and a baby fussing with a full three-day-old diaper and rash, don't let the survival be buried as a failure. After the seventh grade and summer school, after the first bleed and taste of salt water burning the stomach till it empties, after the hospital and increased prescription pending diagnoses and insomnia, don't let the family name die out when it's been triumphant through all the scars. And my second one is based off of another Jacqueline Woodson poem called A Girl Named Jack, which is just about how um, her mom, father, and aunts came up with her name. The one I wrote about it, like 95% of my poems is untitled. Um, a usual poet thing. <laughs> yes, see, yes. <laughs> um, so untitled by me. <laughs> To my fifth grade teacher who said to change my name or else I'll never be taken seriously, fuck you. <laughs> because the power my name portrays with every pronunciation is something you will never experience. My name starts in the back of your throat before slicing over your tongue to hit the back of your teeth, then going back to push the air right out your lungs. Angelique is a mouthful and needs to be savored. You can try and devour me, but the toughness of my skin and the heat I pack inside is enough to make you choke if you ain't careful. Angelique may not fight, but you replace that J with the G and forget the uh at the end, you better mind your P's, cause this Q about to hook you with a jab you ain't going here coming. <laughs> now I can keep going about my name and its strength and power and influence, but I think you've learned your lesson. But Mr. Abrams, you still need some convincing? Buy a copy of The Globe and turn to page 83. See how serious I'm being taken, how much you've been missing. <laughs> the poets are so loud, I love it. <laughs> this next poem, if I have time for it. Yes, OK. Um, I wrote it while I was in the hospital. Um, and at first, it was like a super sad poem. And I'm like, no, we don't need another sad poem. We have enough of that in here. <laughs> Google Docs. So I turned it into, <laughs> I turned it, I t what? I turned it. I turned it, yes, I'm saying that right. I turned it into somewhat of like a reflection poem. So it is called Poetry is My Poison slash letter to the hospital mirror. I am not saying this because I don't love you. I'm saying this because I'm starting to love me more. I'm starting to appreciate the difference between distance and isolation. I'm starting to understand the difference between crying and tears. I'm starting to question why you never kissed me goodnight unless I agreed to hurt you. 
I'm starting to wonder where or rather when did the crack in my mental health get so wide that I found that I found it hard to keep us apart. I'm starting to accept the detox, the bi, -we the bi weekly meetings, the trauma counseling, the tallies in safe and sober days, and the redos and tallies in safe and sober days. I'm starting to believe that I am lovable, that I am not just a person coasting in the ocean as bait instead of a fish. I'm starting to stop the sway of reflection that refuses to reflect on itself. And this last poem that I have time for, <laughs> that I do not have time for, okay? So <laughs> I do not have time for another one, but that is me. I'm Angelique. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just need everybody to know that I do not, I did not make up these rules. I do not need those poets over there, you know, coming at me like, why you didn't let Angelique finish? Um, but please show some more love for Angelique. I also want to encourage you um, to like, you know, snap or give a good ooh. You know, if you hear a line that you really, really enjoy, and, and poets, if you prefer people not to make sounds, we just say that on the mic. Um, but yeah, just make sounds, you know? I think we, we love to hear it, or we love to to um, have energy reciprocated. Where, see, y'all good. Uh, I thought that, that's just like a Cali thing, right? They like say it. Um, Emmanuel Opong Yaboa is on deck. <laughs> this is great. Um, but Lloyd Schwartz is coming up now. Lloyd is poet laureate of Somerville. Frederick S. Troy, professor of English emeritus at UMass Boston. Arts critic for NPR's Fresh Air and WBUR. And an editor of the poetry and prose of Elizabeth Bishop. His awards include the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism, a Pushcart and a Guggenham Foundation, NEA, and the Academy of American Poets Fellowship in Poetry. Um, clearly, absolutely everything. <laughs> His poems have been chosen for the best American poetry and the best of the best American poetry. His latest collection, which I picked up today, um, from Barnes and Nobles, which is closing. Everything's 25% off. If you're a book lover, you should go check it out. I know, it's really sad. Um, the best of the uh, best American poetry. His latest collection is Who's On First? New and Selected Poems. Please, y'all, show some love. Show some love. Give it up for Lloyd Schwartz. Thank you for being here. Portia, thank you for inviting me to read with these extraordinary young poets. I don't usually get to do that. So it's a, it's a great tr treat. Um, a true poem. I'm working on a poem that's so true, I can't show it to anyone. I could never show it to anyone because it says exactly what I think and what I think scares me. Sometimes it pleases me. Usually it brings misery. And this poem says exactly what I think. What I think of myself, what I think of my friends, what I think about my lover, exactly. Parts of it might please them. Some of it might scare them. Some of it might bring misery. And I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt anybody. I want everyone to love me. Still, I keep working on it. Why? Why do I keep working on it? Nobody will ever see it. 
Nobody will ever see it. I keep working on it, even though I can never show it to anybody. I keep working on it, even though someone might get hurt. And the next poem. Um, the next poem is a translation uh, I did of a poem by the great Brazilian, 20th century Brazilian poet, Carlos Drummond de Andrade. It's a poem that was actually on the Brazilian equivalent of a dollar bill. It's called Friendly Song. I'm working on a song in which my own mother sees her image. Everyone's mother sees her image. And it speaks. It speaks just like two eyes. I'm traveling along a roadway that winds through many countries. My old friends, if I don't see them, they see me. They see and salute me. I am giving away a secret, like someone who loves or smiles. In the most natural way, two caresses reach each other. My whole life, all of our lives, make up a single diamond. I've learned a few new phrases and to make others better. I'm working on a song that wakes men up and lets children sleep. Um, Portia, Portia's, one of Portia's ideas for this reading was um, to, for, for us to pay tribute to the poets that we especially admire or were influenced by or that we have inherited something from. Um, I want to pay tribute to someone uh, I admire uh, above many other poets, uh, Elizabeth Bishop, who lived in Boston for uh, the last 10 years of her life and died in 1979. I was fortunate enough to know her. Um, I think she was an extraordinary poet. Uh, and. Um, I want to, she once wrote, though she never actually published this essay, but she, she talked about the qualities that she loved most in the poet she most admired were accuracy, spontaneity, and mystery. And I would like to read um, what I think is now her most famous poem, but if you don't know it, you should. And uh, it's called One Art. <laughs> you, you, you beat me to it. <laughs> One Art. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost, that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day. Accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster. Places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch. And look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned. Two rivers, a continent. I miss them. But it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, 
I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. And I'd like to read uh, two more poems. One of them is very short. The second one is the one that's very short. Um, it's a poem about my mother, and it's a conversation that I had with my mother. It's called, He Tells His Mother What He's Working On. I'm writing a poem about you. You are? What's it about? It's the story about your childhood, the horses in the river, the ones that nearly drowned. I saved them. You told it to me just a few weeks ago. I should dig up more of my memories. I wish you would. Like when I lived on the farm and one of the girls fell down the well. Yes. I forget if it was Rose or Pauline. It was a deep well. I remember that story. Have you finished your poem? I'm still working on it. You mean you're correcting it with commas and semicolons? Exactly. <laughs> when can I see it? As soon as it's finished. Is it an epic? It's not that long. No, I mean all my thoughts, the flashes of what's going through my life, the whole family history, living through the woe, the river and the water. I know. Will it be published? I have to finish it first. It's better to write about real life. That's more important than writing something fanciful. I try to write all my poems about real life. You see, the apple never falls far from the tree. I guess not. You're my apple. There's probably a worm crawling through that apple. Then it's got something sweet to chew on. Well, you're my tree. Yes, I'm your tree. You're an apple. I'm a tree. And the last poem, very short, is called Renato's Dream, Brazil, 1991. Such a sweet dream. I dreamed I was having a conversation with the great poets, Manuel Bandera and Carlos Drummond de Andrade. I was born tired, hungry, and cold, I said. And Drummond answered, I too. Thank you. Oh, we gon' tear all the walls down. We won't bend over backwards. We gon' hit up the Congress. We gon' get back our taxes. Wow. We gon Is this like a local rapper? No, I'm trying to name this artist. Is this Red Shade? Yeah, plan that local. Y'all, if you know, you know. No, but I don't know what that app is where you can like figure out what song it is, but you should do that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like old, I guess. I don't know. Um, word, it is um, the, uh, nearly the end of National Poetry Month. Folks know it was started in 1996 by the Academy of American Poets, and it's modeled after Black History Month. Um, as well as Women's History Month, so. There's some fun facts for you. I'm a nerd, I was thinking we could play trivia all night. Um, <laughs> I bought a couple of prizes, but we'll, we'll get to them. We'll get to them, I promise you. Um, Otto Vock, you are on deck. But coming up right now is Emmanuel Opong Yebois who is a Ghanaian-American poet, editor, and educator living out the diaspora in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, he is both black and alive, 
Born in 1993, Emmanuel, Emmanuel currently teaches 11th grade English at Cambridge Ringe and Latin School. And yeah, shout out to teachers, otherwise most of us wouldn't be writing. Um, and in the past has served as a teaching artist at organizations such as uh, Mass Sleep, um, Cambridge Arts Council, Northeastern University, and the Institute of Contemporary Art here in Boston. When not kicking it with juniors, Emmanuel works as an instructor at the Boston-based nonprofit Grub Street and as an associate editor for Pizza Pie Press. Emmanuel's poem, Crudden, published in Quelly Journal, is a recent recipient of the Pushcart Prize it's okay to give it up for that. In his free time, he enjoys heart carbs. I'm gonna say that again, mostly because I'm just not eating that right now and that sounds really good. In his free time, he enjoys heart, hot carbs, brightly colored chapbooks, and the long sigh at the end of a good book. Emmanuel published uh, their first a uh, collection of poems, a chapbook entitled Not Without Small Joys. This week it was published. Uh, so this is like very, very fresh ink. Please show some love, show some love, show some love. Give it up for Emmanuel! I can't take y'all nowhere. Um, all right, cool, cool, cool. Uh, um, <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Um, I am Emmanuel. I'm going to be reading poems from the chapbook, uh, Not Without Small Joys. Um, I'm so happy to be here and in such good company. Um, so yeah, thank y'all. Um, the chapbook uh, starts with an epigraph, which I'm going to read. Um, it's a quote from uh, another poet, uh, Camon Felix, um, and the quote is from a podcast, uh, The Poetry Gods. Um, uh, the quote is, sometimes I just want the thing that hurts me to be beautiful. I mean, sometimes. Um, <laughs> I'll do it again. I'll do it again. Um, sometimes I just want the thing that hurts me to be beautiful. I mean, sometimes. Um, Cool. Um, the collection is a lot about joy, um, and it's sort of a meditation on joy and also um, how joy sort of arises from grief or can. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to start with a poem. Um, this poem is after uh, Ciara Freeman, who's another poet. Um, and Ciara is really dope, but has a line in her bio, uh, which is about growing her afro. Uh, so long that God thinks it's a mic and speaks through it. Um, and like I read that bio and I was just like, what? Um, and so um, I had a moment which was like, felt like something and that line came to me and so there's this poem. It's called Again. I saw the children of the church playing Jubilee heads all haloed by the setting sun, a band of angels at their feet, the bray of brass lifting them closer and closer still to the vault of heaven. And how could I explain myself to you? I'm sorry, what I mean to say is I felt the death of death inside of me, I saw my own joy dancing outside itself. My joy was a lifted foot, was a bouncy knee, was a chorus of children. My joy was a black boy seated at a drum kit, his fro picked well enough to form a mic, I swear. I heard what some call God strain their neck to speak into. Cool. Um, 
I'm going to read two more poems. Um, like I said, this collection is uh, sort of a meditation on joy, and I thought a lot about joy while writing it um, and what joy was for me, and also like how I'm alive because of joy. Um, and in thinking about what joy is like for me, um, it's something that like colors my experiences. I feel like joy is a difficult emotion to sustain um, because like when it happens in me, it's like a rupture. It's like something that is flooding. Um, and yeah, um, I, while writing these poems, found like the sonnet to be really useful. So I'm gonna read two sonnets. Um, when I learned the sonnet in like high school, middle school, whatever, um, they focus mostly on like iambic pentameter, um, <laughs> like stress, unstress, A, B, A, B. And all of that is like fine, but I feel like what makes a sonnet a sonnet for me is the volta. It's like the turn that happens at the end of the poem that does something for you. And I wish I learned that version of the sonnet in high school because I think it's a lot more interesting. Um, all right, so here are two sonnets. Um, first one is On Grace. On Grace. The kind mama used to fold into a pot of palm nut soup, the oil from the seed, but also the kernel, wet and glistening the pounding of cassava and yam, and the duck of hands below the pestle, the giving of knees, and the surrendering of hands to praise. There, but for the grace of God, go I, and I, and I, a sea of names lost to mourning, a chorus of mourners called to praise, a circle called refuge, orbiting around a black encircling me, a dance of bullets collapse into surrender, a trickle of water churned into a stream. Name it, the flood. Name all our voices, living water, tempest, aroused by the fury of hands called to cool the breeze. What is grace but an allowance? Permission for safe passage, plead all black bodies be and safe from harm to be under good graces to be in good grace to be held in awe. The grace of two dark hands dancing, a hand caught beneath the pestle and the hand cocked back that wounds no one. Um, Cool. Um, I'm going to read one more sonnet and then I'm going to get out of here. Um, this is the last poem that I wrote in the book. Um, it's the second to last poem in the book. Um, but uh, I think right now it's my favorite poem in the collection. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, I'm just going to do it. Here we go. Um, it's called uh, Sonnet to Yield Laughter. Look, Ma. I can smile, huh? There's gold in my teeth and ain't none of them wrapped in foil. The grill get hot trying to stand next to me. I'm star shine, a gold line, a gold sign, a gold tree. Every letter in my name, a gold simile. Periodic tables stay trying to jack my swag. The only orphan parts of me must be the fire I nabbed. Look me in the eye and lie, your soul ain't brighter. 10 times lighter, mustard splattered. What colors grief so messily to leave laughter out the line? Greatest riddle I ever told was trying to hide my shine. Ha! There was a time I wanted to die. <laughs> and here I am, alive, alive. Thank you. Wow. Here I am, alive, alive. I too have been obsessed with the Volta, mostly because of, of the possibility of change, of turning things. Um, okay, really quickly, before I get in trouble, one quick trivia question if you know the answer. Um, I do have a prize. It's we're gonna do auditory first person yell it out, you know, uh, code of honor, be you know, be honest. Um, which and, and poets who are participating cannot participate. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
Um, okay. So, um, which famous poet, which famous American poet um, was born and lived in Jamaica Plain? No, it's not me. Anybody? You, you can be a poet who answers. Nobody knows this. Sylvia Plath, who said that? Okay, word. Sylvia Plath. I was like, that's impossible. I know, right? Silver Club. Where do you see this list? Where do you see this list? Um, all right. Jara Liseaga, you are on deck. But coming up right now is Otto Vock. Otto Vock is a non-binary poet from Jersey City, New Jersey. They've had their work featured on NJ.com and published in the Plum Creek Review. They've interned as a teaching artist at Urban Word NYC. NYC. Uh, a boy pulls out their rib and uses it for lipstick. Is their most recent collection of work that tackles the intersection of being transgender and an abuse survivor, as well as how one heals from trauma and violence caused by the world around them. Give them a shout out at bvoc at urbaland.edu Ober, for a copy of that collection or just to chat and check in around queer identity and poetry. They also teach classes at Grub Street if you're into that. Please y'all show some love. Show some love. Give it up for Otto Vox. Hi. Wow. Uh, I'm really grateful to be in so many company. What? Um, this is a really good uh, sign of how this is about to go. Um, no, but I'm really grateful to be here and, and reading with the voices that, have, that we've heard so far and the voices that we'll hear after and all the voices that have come before me and the poetic heritage of poets and poets and poets and all the voices that will come after me, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, I'll be reading three poems. This first one... Um, I kind of want to like name my uh, like not direct or like not after, but like inspirations for the poem. Uh, a lot of this takes cues, cues from Hanifa Durakib, who's a poet I just love and need, <laughs> um, as well as uh, J.J. Espinoza, who really taught me how to discuss trans grief. Um, and this poem is called "Sorry it took so long to get back to you. I've just been really, really busy." With work, of course work, always work, always making sure all the kites are still tied down where I left them. My G-Cal has just been so packed with colors and rectangular shapes, like <laughs> yesterday I spent the whole morning red, the rest of the afternoon blue. Anyways, yes, it's so-so. Good to hear from you. Yes, my heart rate has been rock solid. I haven't spent hours questioning for the X time in my life how to refer to my own name or dissecting how my body changes, ages. Yes, I have updates on those last action items you inquired about. <laughs> Of course there's been progress, always progress. You wouldn't believe the progress I have been making while my back has been turned on the world. Disappearing is all part of the artistic process. So sorry it took so long to get so behind. I'm exhausted. Never mind. Okay. I'm exhausted from laying in bed all the time. I mean, being at the office all the time. I mean, lying at the home office all the time. I mean, playing body in the casket. I mean, this is where the magic happens. I've been hitting those long hours, scrolling through my phone on the toilet, Long after I'm done with my shit. Sorry, I haven't answered the phone in my hand. I thought you were a robocall this whole time. All I have prepared is robo-responses. 
The other day, I worked until 7 p.m. at my nonprofit's COVID compliant in person open house, but I wasn't. <laughs> It's funny, huh?、Uh, but I wasn't even in the room. I was sat on a worn couch in a dim theater behind my eyes, watched my hands move piles of pamphlets, felt my mouth move. To greet people, heard the sounds I made muffled, like music through the bathroom door of a stranger's house party, until I clawed my way home on what remained of my fingernails. Sorry, I took so long to get back to you that you forgot I would. I was just so busy reminding myself to get back to you, and sitting in my body as it does nothing. To break its still silence, I've been avoiding my avoidances. I've been pulling all these escape hatches, only to find mirrors behind them. Sorry, it took stepping back too long for you. I've just been having dreams again, where all my teeth fall out. I'm swamped with looking over my tartar each morning with the tip of my tongue, just to make sure that it's. All still there. I'm so sorry. I couldn't be more reliable the way I wish I was. I wish I showed up for myself too sometimes. Sorry, I forgot that when I disappear for weeks, I am not the only one I am hurting. So sorry. There's no way back. Another heart I know just stopped responding to its own beating. Another. In a long procession of trans hearts, I've lived to see stop. I haven't felt like dying in a very long time. But what am I supposed to do with this kind of haunting, hunting? How can the thought not cross my mind? Will it ever get me? Sorry. Instead of getting back to you, I'm trauma dumping my body. Is made of many kites that I that have been eyeing their knots. Sorry, it seems like I don't care when I do. So, so much. I've just been so busy, double, triple checking, that I'm still at the other end of the line. Thank you. Um. um So, thank you. Emails are horrible,、um, and that's it. That's the poem. That's the whole poem.、Um, uh, this next poem、um, kind of delves a little deeper into my Jewish heritage.、Uh, I have a lot of family who passed away in the Holocaust, and、um, also just a lot of wonderful Jewish people who survived the Holocaust. Um, uh, and then I lived to see a bunch of、uh, Nazi fuck shit happen. So、uh, this is a response to a lot of that,、um, and、uh, the influences of this poem here、um, come a lot from Sam Sachs, who's a really wonderful Jewish poet,、uh, and th he they、uh, recently released a poem where like each line has like uh, uh, three options for one of the words or the descriptors, and I ended up using it as kind of like a revision tool for this poem. So it was really like. Cool and helpful, and help me dig into it a little bit more.、Um, and then、um, uh, I think another really big influence for this poem is、um, Patricia Smith,、um, who is just Patricia Smith. Like, just <laughs> I don't have to say much.、Um, but、uh, her journalistic power really inspires me. And、um, yeah, if Rachel had not smuggled a letter to her maid. On the last train stop before Auschwitz, her final instructions would have been: and maybe the man storming the Capitol, wearing the Camp Auschwitz hoodie, would have just been dressing up for his office's casual Tuesday. Maybe his hoodie would have meant nothing to me. Because I'd be another nothing under history's rotting tongue, Rachel would have not warned her maid 
to take the children, the family heirlooms, run. I would not have held the weight of that page or cemetery in my grandpa's study filled with Omi's handwritten recipes for Austrian desserts on yellowed paper, filed next to the Nazis' careful or omniscient records of where each of my ancestors became a ghost. I could have been a ghost before I had even died, a ghost heavier than the smell of. So, I've clung to the many loves or ghosts of mine who are miraculously still alive or remembered. The red bird perched in my snow-covered backyard, the warm cheeks of my lovers I've stamped with my lips, my great um uncle Philip who survived, the death march from Auschwitz to nowhere or history, his journal entry of the day American GIs liberated him from the Russians read, Europe is dead, long live America. In a different world, maybe my sister's wedding registry wouldn't have included a multi-stage food processor. Instead, a gun, with a Nazi's severed finger dangling from it like a keychain, maybe she'd have to use that gun in America, or maybe instead of working as a producer for true crime television, she would be true crime. My brother-in-law, brewing coffee kombucha in their small Astoria apartment, would instead stick his finger into the jar placed on their only south-facing window to taste the brewing nitroglycerin. Maybe enough of my nation lives buried under message boards or alternative worlds that Hillary really did eat that baby under the pizza shop. So Rachel doesn't burn in Auschwitz, no. Instead, she heads the board of directors at NASA, managing the cover-up of the Earth's flat, scorched face. Mouse is banned in public schools. Philip rides the Rothschild space laser between his thighs like the nuke from Dr. Strangelove and kisses the West Coast forests goodbye. I'd be living on a throne of exploited blood instead of living on a throne of exploited blood. I have a shotgun strapped to my Kevlar back just in another world. In that world, I have good aim outside my violent silicon wet dreams. In that world, I'm as free as the water droplets suspended in my unmuzzled breath or weapon. When I see vermin or viral or growth, I think empty shell. In that world, everything is mine or it's kindling. Thank you. Okay, so to not leave us in too bummer of a space, um, I, it's a short one, don't worry, sorry, thank you. <laughs> oh, no, okay, cool. <laughs> um, uh, this is a short one, uh, and it uh, also kind of speaks to Jewish mysticism, which I really have been taking a lot of inspiration from, and I've been writing a series of poems from the voice of a golem, so in the kind of tradition of Jewish, the Jewish version of a golem, I don't know if that's the only place where it appears, but um, uh, it's a, you know, a man made of clay and then uh, sacred words on a scroll are put on its mouth and that's its instructions for its task and then science fiction turned that into robots so like there's a heritage of like storytelling with the golem too um but i've just been thinking a lot of the golem as a symbol of resisting fascism and like loving yourself <laughs> so um i've wrote a series of poems in the voice of the golem and this first one is the golem contemplates Prozac. <laughs> yeah, Prozac, everybody who has some Prozac in the house. Woo! Oh dear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am a medicine of an older age where sickness was an arrow in the chest, a limb gone to black rot, livestock caught in a tar pit. An alchemical age, as in, first there was a people, then there was smoke. 
Then there was children of that smoke. Who'd have thought the thing made of mud would move and think like mud? Like earth, slow, indifferent, adrift. And the empty gape of God's immeasurable jaws, capsule prayer, little blue planet, chemical scroll, incantation of molar mass. I place on my tongue a new set of instructions. Protect what the fire left. And what the fire left was me. Thank you. But I don't know the words, you know. Um, but I think I sound exactly like him. Um, one time for our DJ Washam, who is a Taurus, who's celebrating a birthday last weekend. Happy birthday! No, okay. All right. Um, uh, trivia number two. What is the title of the book written by Boston's inaugural Youth Poet Laureate, Alondra Bobadilla? You could just yell it out. With Clip Wings! With Clip Wings! Okay! I, I got really excited, I'm sorry. Yes, um, our inaugural Youth Poet Laureate published with Clipped Wings. Um, shout out to Legacy. If you pass Clip Wings, see me after. Um, Closing us out and on deck is Amani Davis. Coming up right now is Jara Liceaga. Excuse me, Jara Liceaga Rojas. Thank you. Forgive me. Is a mother, a poet, a writer, an artist, and a consultant in the art sector. She is a 2021 Letras Boricuas Fellow, a 2021-2023 Boston Neighborhood Fellow, and a 2019 Brother Thomas Fellow. Her work and art projects have been supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, Flamboyant Foundation, Mass Cultural Council, Cambridge Arts, NIFA, Boston Center for the Arts, the Boston Foundation, Kendall Projects, Meet Us Collaborative, Assets for Artists, the MGCC, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, and the entire city of Boston. Really incredible human being. I don't know if you know, but it said in the beginning a consulting, I will be you know, hitting you up later. She has curated or led the projects Poetry is Busy, which I had the pleasure of attending and that's how we met. Uh, Acentos Espasos, which translates to Thick Accents. El Despojo Project and her latest Encarnar, which translates to Embody. Jara is also the author of five, five poetry books. Most of her work is based on the visibility of marginalized subjects and identities. Y'all, show some love. Show some love for Jara! Mira, give it up for Portia, who read my name beautifully. Gracias, Portia. Ok, mi gente, so, buenas noches. Me encanta. <laughs> ok, so, ahora, yo no los veo bien. I don't see you that well, pero we're going to do a poem together, ok? Sí, and what I need you to do is the person you have next to you, ¿verdad? If you don't have a person next to you, move around and find your person. Why, Sham? Vente para acá. 
Come here with me. We're going to do something together. Ok, mi gente. Esto es lo que vamos a hacer. This is what we're going to do. So we are going to do this poem together. ¿Verdad? This is one, the one poem that I'm going to read to you that's mine. I'm going to read after that one. Um, a poem by one of the people, bueno, one of the poets that has influenced me a lot. Bueno, one of them is in my earrings, de Julia de Burgos. I'm sure some of you know her. Pero la otra, the other one, is Angela Maria Davila, one of the black Puerto Rican poets, women poets, mother, and performer and whatnot. Unfortunately, she passed away many years ago, pero her work is still around. Pero, okay, so now, the people that has only one person look for your partner for this poem because it will require for you to have an experience that because tranquilícense easy easy <laughs> take it easy so the pandemic brought us a lot of distancing and isolation and it's quite hard to come together again you know and being a human with other humans intimacy just got really tu sabes scratchy scratchy and so <laughs> So now we want to mend it together y darle cariño. Okay, so people, okay, so what I want you to do is look at yourselves, ¿verdad? Why, Sean, vente para acá. Come here. Okay, so, dale, vente, vente aquí, vente aquí. So that, I get, so that I can tell it to the microphone. Okay, so. So you are going to listen and repeat. If you don't understand what you're saying, no worries, okay? Don't feel bad, it's okay. Just bear with me and repeat out loud, okay? okay. ¿Está todo el mundo ready? Sí? Okay, perfect, okay. Vente, Waisham, espérate, vamos a ver. Okay. You are going to repeat this looking in the eyes of the person next to you. Okay? Estamos ready. <laughs> are we ready? Okay. Why sham? Estamos aquí. Estamos aquí. Okay. Repeat after me. Esa es buena. And so that means they're listening. Okay. El mundo no es otra cosa. Que lo que somos. Mientras estamos colocando. Diminutos paquetitos. Repletos de inseguridades <laughs> en el pecho del otro. Uno se aleja tan desconcertado. Deseando regresar a buscar. Lo que se deja almacenado, forrándose de partículas de polvo y salitre. Asume la parte de desespero que le toca. Asume del ojo. Acoplarse a la mirada. Que una misma produce. Cuando regresa. 
y te mira. Mientras el hambre va naciendo en todas las bocas. Give yourselves a big round of applause. <laughs> The world is none other than what we are while we're placing tiny little packages filled with insecurities in the chest of the other. One leaves the scene so puzzled, wishing to return to seek what is left stowed, accumulating salt residue and particles of dust. Allow the aspect of despair that belongs to one's self come into focus. Get used to the gaze that one gives when one returns and looks at you while hunger is born in the body's every mouth. That was what you just said to your partner. <laughs> Okay, whoa, okay. Great, thank you, Spanish. <laughs> okay, Angela Maria Dávila. Cuando se ponen juntas todas las pocas cosas que se saben, yo sé que somos animales, que detestamos apasionadamente la soledad, que para construirnos tenemos que juntarnos y que tenemos manos que transforman los árboles, las frutas, los otros animales, las montañas, el agua. Un cerebro que acuña historias milenarias para ponerla al frente de los ojos de un niño. Pichón de gente, cachorrito pensante que transforma en montaña la arena, en río caudaloso el algún chorrito de agua, en mariposa o pájaro, la mano temblorosa. Yo también sé que buscamos caminos para poder juntarnos, que como en el antes remoto que intuimos, donde nos construíamos sin soledad, sin enturbiar los ojos de los niños, transformándolo todo para todos. Yo también sé que a golpe y a porrazo, pero que no de golpe y porrazo, quitamos la maleza para hacer el camino que queremos. Tan simple como trabajar juntos sin que haya un dueño del trabajo que se alimente de toda la miseria. Como cambiarlo todo con las manos para que quede libre su caricia para poder amar mirándonos a los ojos, sin tener que por fuerza preguntarnos, ¿qué nos quitará este? ¿Qué comemos mañana? Y entonces, ya sabremos y nos quedará tiempo para poder saber todas las cosas que aún desconocemos. Angela Maria Dávila, thank you so much. Wow, wow, how are y'all feeling? Thank you for giving that sex space to reconnect um, as humans, right? And to like stretch our language and what we think we know, right? Um, or me, at least. Okay. Um, really quick trivia question. This is the one that woke me up at like 6 a.m. this morning. I just had to find this information out suddenly. Um, really, really weird. Okay, how many former U.S. poet laureates have ties or connections with the state of Massachusetts? By ties, I mean you were either born here, you either died here, or you lived here, or live here. How many? 
Yeah, I hate number questions because they're really just a guessing game. Nobody said it yet, but you're close. Oh, I did hear it. Somebody said nine. We cannot have those poets winning. Um, we will we'll figure this out, but it is nine. Nine of them with the possible who went to school here. Three who are here and working and living currently. Um, so yeah, welcome to this place. No. Um, all right, so we will be closing out with a poet by the name of Amani Davis. Amani Davis is a queer black writer from Brooklyn, a recipient of fellowships from the Mellon Foundation, Lambda Literary, Boat Press, and the Stratler Center. They hold a BA in English and Africana Studies from the University of Pennsylvania and currently is pursuing a PhD in American Studies at Harvard University. Amani's poetry, yup, a doctor to be, uh, okay, sorry, <laughs> got really excited. I get excited about doctors, okay. Um, <clears throat> Amani's poetry appears with Best New Poets 2020, PBS News Hours Brief But Spectacular series, TEDx, Best of the Net, The Offing, Poetry Daily, The Rumpus, Frontier Poetry, Brooklyn Poets, Shade Literary Arts and all over the world. Y'all, show some love. Show some love for Monty Davis. I had my platforms on today and everything. I said, I'm gonna be tall enough for this mic. It didn't happen. Maybe all I need to be is Rico Nasty. <laughs> At least for now, while her raspy sermon pierces the house party, it is enough to be a splintered storm, grief spiking in every direction. Rico launches a molasses shriek and the sound makes men neon in their seats. I have been afraid of anger for too long. What beast it could summon from beneath the river of my skin. I know I carry my father's face, why not his fist too? His jagged impulse for blood, as a child, I wrote horror stories starring everyone who'd ever wronged me. <laughs> Shayla pushes me during recess and the narrative pushes her down a well. Poor girl. <laughs> Poor choice, victim of a nameless anger, death note soaked in salt water. Later, I lost baby teeth and learned myths of the monsters buried in the mouths of black femmes. How all the fright I could deal by just raising my voice, but I'm learning to rage without worrying what a scream can cost me. The first time I hear Rico Nasty's popping, everything in me forgets its cage. I sugar screech the lyrics, don't worry about the words, cause all the best monsters never need a script. And for the flickering eternity of this song, I will be no different. Why commit to meaning when the feeling is enough? And who better to learn from than Rico, rich in the sacred currency of a howl, brat's doll minotaur, all-knowing type of bitch, familiar with the, f the specific magic graveling through my headphones. And when she's with me, I become the bride of chaos. I make sorrow a mosh pit and brew shame past recognition. I thank every god on my chain that I ain't have to smack a bitch today. And so what if I did? Who gonna beat my ass? No one. Um, dressed as my favorite rapper, Rico Nasty. <laughs> um, and I get, I tried to bring stuff that was homage esque. Cool. Mm -mm. Um, this was this poem would not be possible without two people, uh, Natalie Diaz and Tracy Smith. Absidarian in the party supply aisle with nothing to celebrate. 
Approach makes all the difference, you hummed faithfully beneath your breath. Believed it too. To be honest, you couldn't imagine the truth being any further than a good homemade dinner away. So off your goofy ass went to the grocery store. Evil as it sounds, it excited you, entering the eternal ensemble of betrayed femme fiancés. And for fuck's sake, you had your reasons. <laughs> All the girls were guzzling gossip regarding where your girlfriend's particular hips had happened last holiday season and with whom. It wasn't not an interrogation. <laughs> what you staged to go down with an inkling of joy come dinner time at old girl's tacky dining room set. Knives were involved, but kept for the harder parts of the evening. Lies were, too. Lovingly as you lobbed your questions, laced with measured amounts of doom, she maintained her myths. Nah, I ain't never even seen him naked. <laughs> the natural noise these niggas offer offhandedly in hopes of occasioning your silence. <laughs> Perhaps she thought you a close relative of Boo Boo the Fool. <laughs> <laughs> Quite strange considering the lack of laughter in the room. Regardless of her reasoning, she had the wrong one. Should have slighted someone siloing less suspicion inside, but teasing out the truth might not temper the tempest upending your gut, but you'll hunt until you've unveiled your villain as the good Lord Scooby-Doo intended. <laughs> Vexed, she would have got away with it if not for the chaos. <sighs> she would have got away with it if not for the chaos awake within your unmedicated youth. Yeah, <laughs> you might be crazy, <laughs> but Zam, bitch. You won't be nobody's fool. Um, finally, big shout out to Gwendolyn Brooks and Terrence Hayes. Um, this is a golden shovel. If you know, you know. The girls that get it, get it. Like. Golden shovels sheltered in place with Animal Crossing logout text and OCD. If you don't know, my favorite video game is Animal Crossing. Uh, it's a video game. That's all you need to know. <laughs> um, yeah. And the tagline that you get when you're trying to save the game is ready to wrap things up for now. Despite the plans you've tended like infants, you are decidedly unready. And without the evergreen prey of the weekday, your brain turns towards its owner, sick, gentle weapon that it is. You spend weeks wilting, wrap yourself corpse-like in a gurgle of gray sweats, refusing the prophecy of things going back to normal soon. You know your country. <laughs> So you give up on the God-given dawn, turn your console on, and do the American thing. Forget. Bewitched by pixels, you stink of lonely, but Nintendo don't mind. <laughs> now this is a life worse the precise affections of your eye. Doubled on screen, you ready your automated heaven for no one's visit. Chat with handfuls of code designed to love you back. Every lily is accounted for, every gift assigned correctly to its wrap. It's months before diagnosis. You feed the greedy woodpecker in your head the things it demands. Tunnel into giddy digital until every window inside of you fogs up. You're not playing. You need this routine. Still, you know, you. Pretend the pastel tasks aren't longed for in a silly effort to save face. When Tom Nook calls for you, you fondly fume. What now? Thanks. Give it up for Rico Nasty's doppelganger. No, I'm kidding. Uh, that was Amani Davis, y'all. Um, please show some love for all of the poets that touch stage. Show some love yet again for our DJ Washam. 
to show some love to WBUR for hosting. And show some love for yourself, you know. I think for me, it sometimes it's harder to leave the house ever since quarantine gave me per permission to be there all the time. Um, so show some love for yourself for coming out. <laughs> Try not to get fired, but last trivia here. Which St. Lucian poet and Nobel Prize winner founded the Boston Playwrights Theater? It's the big money one here. Which, yes, Derek Walcott, they got it, I'm sorry. Who said it first? Yeah, that's Derek Walcott started uh, Boston Playwright Theater. Um, what year was um, National Poetry Month founded? Okay, boom, right there, that's, that's all the books we got. Um, it's been, <laughs> I'm actually ridiculous, but I do have prizes, okay. Um, Thank you all so much. We're incredibly over time. Um, I think that there will be a little bit mingling out in the lobby. And if people want to buy books, um, we had to close the bar. We're over time. There's like different books that are left, but we've got the poets who have some of the books to sell, and they will mingle. And let's all go in the lobby and meet them and support them. Thank you. You don't have to go home, but you have to go to the lobby. Somehow, trust them all that I could take. Pity for pity's sake.